you want to introduce yourself? I am originally from Ohio. I moved up here in the fall, and I've kind of gotten very just submersed in all of the hunting community, done a whole bunch of the learn to hunts and working my way up to being a mentor myself. So John kind of asked me to join as far as, you know, John's on the other end where he knows all the things and he's like the super hunter <laughs> fisher. <Well. laughs> and then I'm on the other end. So to kind of give that perspective of experiences. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to keep it really informal. We want a lot of questions and I'll blow through some of the stuff that I think is a little bit more, more marginal. So, um, is there, you yeah, know, but is, yeah, that's a good, yeah. Why don't yeah. we, is there, you know, do you guys have any specific interests? What kind of brought you guys? Like, do you guys want to get out and mentor? Do you have friends? You know, do you guys have any thoughts as far as interest in mentoring or why you came today versus going to get lunch? <laughs> I'm gonna start calling on people. <laughs> she will do it, I know. <laughs> In the friendliest way possible. I mean, have you guys mentored before? Do you th can you think of people in your life that probably want to get out hunting or fishing or into the outdoors? Is it family, friends? Yes. Your well, brother? Does he have a lot of outdoor experience? Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's funny, that's a pretty common theme when we get into this. I think most people who were recruited for hunting or came from a hunting family, you know, they don't necessarily need, you know, a program or a hand up. Um, but a lot of times you, if, especially as far as recruiting adults, you know, you're starting from zero. And so it's really good to, you know, not assume that people know certain things. Like, you know, you'll say, well, you put in a full choke for turkey and people are like, not only don't I know why you would do that, but I don't know what a choke is, you know? So you just say, well, you know, yeah, it constricts the shot pattern. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll get going here. Um, so, you know, what is a mentor? This is, this is, uh, that's what this talk is, is about. And, um, you know, as you go through it, you know, th think about your ideas of, of what a mentor is. Is it different than a coach? Is it different than an instructor? You know, what is it that, like, if you were going to do it, what, what, um, how would you view yourself? I think it's also important to think it's not this super formal thing. You know, John, the first learn to hunt I went on was for pheasants, and then you kind of make those connections, and then we formed a good friendship where he's become a good mentor. He invited me to come talk, and you start getting more opportunities. So it's not this super formal thing of just doing Yes, they absolutely need the mentors for the learn to hunt because that's always the limiting factor, but also just like friends or family or... Yeah, very much so. And I mean, I, in some ways, like the, the biggest lift is when you're just sort of taking out your, your neighbor or your, or your, you know, taking someone out is, 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 a, is a big lift, even if it's not reported. So like in someone who wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity is even, even better from a recruitment standpoint. Um, there are some videos. I think we're going to skip the videos today because I, I really like to do more interaction, but this just sort of talks more about conservation funding, a little bit about the North American model and why it is with hunter numbers declining, why it is we need to talk about backfilling those. Cause do you guys, how familiar are you guys kind of with this? So we know that there's, what is the Robert Pittsman? Pittman Robertson. Uh, Pittman yeah. Robertson backwards. Um, that, you know, the sales of all the equipment that goes to help support the conservation and that's with the declining population, um, that that's really going to impact as far as conservation and accessibility and that good stuff. Yeah. And so no, you know, without, without the mentor leg of this, it's this, this whole thing kind of falls flat. Um, <clears throat> you know, why are we doing this? You know, we're, we're looking to, you know, create a core of mentors to work with people beyond youth. Um, the other thing is that there's no, as I say, there's, there's no R3 or recruitment and retention without, without mentors because they, people who don't know need someone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's also important, different populations. This isn't just a youth thing. This is, yes. you know, I, me as an adult, I'm just getting into hunting. I, you could put anything in my hands, I can shoot it, but putting those pieces together to go out hunting is a different kind of component. And also women hunting, or even, you know, I think there's older folks that want to get out and sure. hunt compared to feel like it's a lot of youth just want to get out and that's not necessarily the case yeah and it's it's great and it's sort of like well I guess I kind of feel like I have a one kid uh and 
I just sort of felt like I was probably the best qualified to teach her to go hunting. You know, I can know when her blood sugar starts to drop. I know when she's getting cold, know when she's not having a good time. So I feel like when I'm educating adults, you know, I'm also educating potentially like a spouse or a family. And so the idea is that you get more, more lift by doing it that way. So two, two for the price of one, you know. And then at some point, you know, it was kind of the big dream down the road is maybe DNR, Pheasants Forever, um, becoming an outdoors woman. Various organizations have, have a database where they can call on mentors and say, oh, I need help with a pheasant hunt, squirrel hunt, grouse hunt, you know. Um, yes? Um, I guess just to go back, I, the only reason I'm sitting here is because one is two things, a town chair, I'm just looking for who's going to follow me. So mentoring is, regardless of what you do, there, there may be certain things you yeah. pick up in. How does, why does the guy get serious as far as her wanting to move up from a superintendent to down here? And what you got to need to know? Or even in our trad world, I'm a trad archer. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, that has picked up where all the other people are going to crossbows and all this other uh -huh. stuff where I came from. Yeah. Come from, but archery clubs actually make more money having traditional shoots. That's super. I, I, it, it's, you would not believe it, but there's a, uh, there's a reason why next week you'll see at least 50 tents and trailers and campers out here. Huh. I mean, we, this club makes more money. My club, one of my clubs. Mm -hmm. we make, so there's a me mentoring where people are afraid, in this case, how, you know, just to have fun, mm -hmm. archery, and not that you're hitting that spot. Well. well so, and, so I'm here for just pick up certain things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, the best thing is to have fun. Mm -hmm. which we do at our traditional it, school. We can't and I think it's really important too. You know, I've done some of the Becoming Outdoor Woman events up here with Peggy. Like I've done stuff with John. And the important thing is like if you're not having fun, let's change something because the whole point is to get you out here. You're not letting anybody down. You know, I think people need to hear that sometimes. They always do a good job of suppliers setting the premise. You don't have to be perfect. We're here right. to have fun. Let's learn some new things. And I think you're exactly and, hitting the nail on the head. And, and you're right. There's, we don't say that. <laughs> we don't you can say. Mistakes. We, we actually pick our shots through the woods. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And it's to have fun. Mm -hmm. and, we yeah. ban and we banter a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you don't like to be bantered with, you're not going to shoot with some group of folks. Mm -hmm. Right. But we have fun. I mean, it's. it's and that's kind of knowing your audience too, as far as, you know, some people can handle that, love that environment. Some people really need to be taken to the fundamentals. And I, that's where I think sometimes it's important too, as far as asking them, what are their yeah. goals? What are they comfortable with? Um, I think some of the learn to hunts, you kind of get a real mixed bag as far as, you know, people that have never handled a shotgun to, you know, I can go out there and get some perfect shots on a pheasant and that's right. like mind blowing for me. And that's where catering, I think, is always kind of the hard part because you never know when folks are coming in, but kind of and, doing that screening. And it's about using your, I think one of the most important things is sort of communication and kind of figuring out where, where, what, what, what your audience is, you know, because mm -hmm. you say, you know, I have, when I go out with my group of buddies, we rib each other when we miss shots. Mm -hmm. If someone was just starting out, that wouldn't work for them, yep. right? But it works yep. great. Like when my buddy Jason misses a rabbit, I'm like, oh my gosh, was it standing <laughs> still there, dude? What are you doing? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Or I'm, you know, I'm the sort that's comfortable. Just throw me out there and it's like, I'll give it back to you, but I'm going to be trying my best, you know. And that's where those groups are needed, but then sometimes the different catering, what we're kind of trying to aim for. Yeah. And for the record, since this is being recorded, I'm usually the one that misses. It's not my, my buddy Jason, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> this is just a, at a glance what's happening with hunters, hunter numbers. This is Wisconsin a couple of years ago, probably four or five years ago. Nationwide, pretty much the same curve. You look at any kind of species, pretty much the same trajectory. Um, it's, it's not a great picture, but we're trying to figure out ways to, how can we connect with, with new audiences? And I guess the reason that's important is because we have this model where we pay for conservation through Pittman Robertson and licenses. Yep. Another video, R3, Recruitment, Re Retention, Reactivation. Um, that's what my job title is. This became, when people started to look at those, those drop-offs, this became sort of the moniker for all of those things put together. And so basically you want to, you know, get new people on board, keep folks engaged that are there, and then get people who have fallen off the wheel 
to go back on it. And interestingly, the third, the reactivation, probably the hardest lift, because like something will have happened to have caused that person to fall off the, the, the wheel. So maybe like loses access to a property or the person that he went to the deer camp with died or, mm -hmm. or maybe you get an injury or, or you know, or kind of bringing it back to your example of, you know, like next weekend, is it like an event that's for beginners or is it just like a group event that you were talking about? Okay. Yep. Yep. And so then that's where, you know, then maybe having that separate event of like an afternoon thing for those beginners that are just getting used to that versus being super intimidating to come into an event where everybody's well, like established. And, and that could be the retention, you know, that could yeah. keep them in, you know, being retained or you could even reactivate them with, with that. Just like different options for kind of shifting that focus. Cause I think you're exactly right when you're kind of describing that. Um, you know, so we talked about the North American model. Does, do you guys know in a nutshell what that's ab about? Essentially, it's that uh, wildlife is in the public trust in this country. So a lot of other countries around the world, that's not the case. I'm going to see Steve Rainella does a pretty decent job. If I can click on this, and we can. You have to control click. Yeah, do, do you mind trying to see if we can get, and, and if not, it's, it's really not a big deal, but this is one of the better videos, I think. Where's that over there? There we go. A skit? <laughs> Takes a few more drinks, I think, to, to get me to do a skit. Oh, it's not connected to the internet. Not connected. You know what? That's yeah, fine. Then we're good. We're good. Then this just talks about, so anyway, wildlife is in the public trust, managed by sound science, no frivolous waste. Like if you hunt something, even if it's a coyote or something, you have to do it for a legitimate purpose, if that's predator control or fur. Um, the rule of law governs, governs this instead of commerce. Um, well, and the fact that we have a ridiculous amount of access to public land compared to other places in the world. And even other places in Wisconsin, like above yep. Wausau, you've got some counties have north of 50% public land. It's not as mm -hmm. good in the south, but that notion of like public land and that hunting is for everybody is very different than other, other countries in mm -hmm. the world. Even to a certain extent, other states that with less pro public land, it's harder to, for folks to on-ramp. Mm -hmm. uh, so these, these, are the, these are the seven principles. I'm not going to read them out to you. But those are those are essentially what I was just saying here, and then we're going to get we're going to loop back to mentoring. This is maybe too much background. Well, and I think that stuff is important from the regards to. I think one of the biggest barriers not only is it equipment. You know, people either don't have guns, don't have whatever weapon, don't have the bows, aren't comfortable with them. But it's also, where the heck am I supposed to get out? How am I supposed to get out? Where am I picking my spot? And that's what that is kind of the foundation of understanding that we have so much accessibility and the average person doesn't know that. Yeah, that's actually a really, that's a really much be a better way to say it instead of the whole long thing about, the, you know, this, this model and Teddy Roosevelt, all very interesting. But the point is that from a newbie, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily care about Teddy Roosevelt. You want to go yeah. out hunting. Yep. And how do you do it? Yep. Um, how do you do it safely? And so, so anyway, the part of baked into, so this is just a sketch. They call it the outdoor recreation adoption model, fancy term for a simple notion of like, how does a person become a hunter or an angler? Same way you do anything, like a language or learn to learn, learn a trade or something. You know, immersion and social support and deciding that you wanna do it and then you end up over here on the continuum and at that point, you can recruit others. So essentially our, my classes are trying to push people from the left to the right on this model. They, they think about it, they see themselves, they participate and then, and then they go on to, to recruit others. I mean, I think I'm the perfect yeah. example of it because, um, you know, did pheasant, I did the pheasant hunt. Then I think I did the turkey hunt with you guys too. And every time I told John, I was like, you need more female mentors because you guys are great at teaching us, but I see nobody here. <laughs> like, right. And that's when I started getting volunteered. But I think it's also an important aspect of it too. I'm comfortable throwing myself in these situations where you're getting ribbed. You can kind of give it back. You're having a good time. But like, I think women are a very up and coming population, especially with the hunting. And, you know, women learn a little bit different. So that's kind of, you know, I think I got a 
going both ways and I'm the perfect example of getting involved. I made it known I wanted to be involved and I'm passionate about getting others out there. And so that's our three model of work right there it, already. So. It, it, and yeah, like, like at warp speed, like normally it takes people a lot longer to get through classes, mm -hmm. but you're much more yep. motivated yep. than the average and person. And you started mentoring people in fishing. Yep, I've, he's got me started mentoring people in fishing. I'm gonna start getting groups together for that. Even before I came up to Wisconsin, I was training for you know being a firearms instructor, especially specializing in women, that sort of thing. So it's kind of just been a nice continuum, so. Yeah, no, great, great point of view. All right, keep moving along here. Um, anyway, this is this is what we just talked about more. Um, so, and <clears throat> I think the other reason this is this is worth bringing up is like this could be Trish here, and you know, whereas if you think about what does the typical hunter look like today, probably looks a lot like me or Doug or Bill, and I, it's only because or, or Tony that tend to be you know guys in their mid to late you know, middle age, and that's because there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's, it's, it, it, it's just that the population of the world and the population that we might be recruiting doesn't necessarily look that way. So mm -hmm. you just have to, so to, to Trisha's point, you know, women are 50% of the population, 13% of hunters. So there's a huge opportunity to work mm -hmm. with, with uh, women there. And then, you know, if you look at what demographers say that by 2040, country will probably be majority minority. And so you have to, from just a business conservation standpoint, you have to work with all sorts of people um, to, to make sure that, that, that it's, it's relevant and understood. And this is just as a business model, if, you do, if you're not diversified, it will, never, it will never go into the future here. So anyway, you know, um, 25 to 40, I would say, half male, half female, didn't grow up hunting. And that's, that's that is our, in a way, that's our bread and butter, you know? So like, I always it's, feel like it's important too to welcome people in and not say, oh, it's dumb that you don't know what a choke tube is or the difference between a muzzle loader and, and maybe a, you know, conventional rifle or, well, and you my, know. My yeah. experience too has been, if you've been doing this your whole life, you don't realize what you know. And you, that has been the biggest thing. And I, I'm again, the person I can go with the flow. I'm comfortable with, any of the firearm stuff, so I'm not worried about that. And that has given me the foundation, but a lot of people don't have that. Or they're in the situation, they don't know what questions that they need to ask, you know? My biggest things was, how do I get out? How do I find the good spot? How do you read the woods? Read how these animals are moving, all that sort of stuff. Any of you experienced hunters, you can walk out there and say, you know, that's this, this, and this. You can see this trail, you can see with it being rut and all of this sort of stuff. The average person's like, well, look at that tree. Right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and it's all these subtle signs because learning to read the woods is just as much of a skill. And that's another barrier to get out there because, you know, I've told John of like, I still want to be getting out for a while with folks because talking about your unsuccessful hunts, if I'm going out there and I'm sitting out there, I'm like, I'm doing something wrong because I'm not seeing the deer when really maybe it's just a crappy day of hunting. Right. And I think that's another important thing, too, because, you know, same thing with fishing. So I think that's really important as far as providing the whole picture. And, and, and you know, by all means, like, explain, you know, communicate and explain, you know. So, like, it, it, you know, you think, you think that going out there, you want to you mentee, let's get the person a turkey, deer, squirrel, trout. And that's nice. That's icing mm -hmm. on the cake. I'm not going to lie. It's, mm -hmm. It feels really good for you and the mentee to do that. But if you do it and you don't explain it, it doesn't it doesn't anything. stick in the teaching way so it's sort of like if someone said to me what's more important that the person tag out or that the person learn i'm going to mm -hmm. say the person's learning and the communication is more important because with the just tagging out you get that whiz bang and it feels good but they have no idea how to replicate it they're never going to get back out on their own you know i i think both of the turkey hunts i went on on this year were unsuccessful but the first one was, besides the fact that I didn't get a turkey, it was a picture perfect hunt. You know, we had the Jakes, we had the Toms, we had a whole group of them. But I learned more from that than if I had just been out there for just because I'm like, I need to get a turkey. Because, and I think also with the hardcore hunters, sometimes just because you have the experience, let all of your biases go. I don't care if you think that a real turkey hunter doesn't use a blind. I'm not out there to figure out how to be a quote-unquote real turkey hunter. It's more of 
what's the experience and what's all the steps to get me to the level that you're hunting at? Almost like an apprenticeship in a way. Yeah. Like and, if you're, you know. And I think that's where like, I've met so many great hunters, but it's a little bit different skill set as far as what does this person want to do? The learning is more important. Obviously we, you know, it's always been driven home. It's your shot. You take it if you're just comfortable. It's not, you're going to be pressured into it. But having those conversations before you get out there are critical to a good experience. And if you're rushed or if you're stuck with kind of what your idea of hunting is, it, you know, it could potentially turn somebody off from hunting. And that's what none of us want because we're all passionate about it. We're all passionate as far as the land and conservation. And, you know, going back to kind of the thing, if you're not having fun, if you're not learning, we need to adjust something because it's about, you know, if you're doing the full mentorship thing, um, making sure that it's enjoyable and that they're learning. Yeah, yeah, sir. I think uh, sometimes when you're on the woods and you do not kill anything, mm -hmm. a few short years ago, three or four, I actually thought of the tall bears coming in, but it happened to be tall grass, it was a uh, um, bobcat, and I didn't realize when one bird affiliated came into it, I, I didn't realize there was a nest in an oak tree, and I was able to watch that once I re really that bobcat jumped up and pulled that other affiliated the ma out of Oh my goodness. And mm -hmm. that was their lunch. So just an experience like that. that mm -hmm. And it took years that people sit there. Yeah. So something like that happened to that whole piece of that. Well and, and, and I actually got up, I didn't know what it was, I had my camera going for the videos, but uh, mm -hmm. it was neat to see something like that, knowing that that goes on day in and day out. And I absolutely love that because when I went on a squirrel hunt when it was through a few. we were freezing our butts off. It was a great day being out there, but I mean, the woods were dead. And I was talking to my mentor after the fact, and I was like, you know, I put a lot of pressure on myself because it's like, you want to get out there, you want to hunt. And he's like, honestly, I have friends that go out in off season, just go with a camera. Go with a camera and just learn to sit in the woods because that's almost like a skill of its own. You're not just going out there for a shot or going out to hunt. And that's how you kind of get all of that going because I think new hunters, you just want to kind of want to get there, even though you want to learn and you want to get that high, but it can kind of backfire because then you're kind of putting too much pressure on yourself, mm -hmm. which I've heard from several folks. So, and I, the only thing that I can guarantee, like, is that it's going to be a safe hunt and then, you know, would be fun because you'll communicate and you'll know mm -hmm. when the person's not having a good time. The other thing I tell people is that if you keep at it long enough, I can't guarantee what you will bag you'll have nat experiences in the natural world that are like that yeah. are not like when you're hiking and i don't know really why that is i, I think maybe because you're quieter paying you attention in a different way yeah, yeah yeah i think it's because you're so fly and that's why i try to explain to my hunters i remember a few years ago this one gal i met who was seen like she's like i love nature like, what do you do i go hiking at Lavin peak and i'm like well that's cool <laughs> but and she's like how can you hunt and i explained to her i'm like there's you're, you're quiet and you immerse yourself in nature so the forest kind of forgets you're there and goes mm -hmm. back. That's a nice way to put it. That's the way I would put it. Nature mm -hmm. forgets that a person is there and you get to see stuff. And I think one of the coolest experiences I ever had was back in 2014. Mm -hmm. I didn't get any deer that year, but I saw a lot of large bucks cross my path. And I think the coolest fun thing that I had was while I was out squirrel hunting with my dad's 22. And I was sitting in this small little blind that I just found someone made out of sticks. Mm -hmm. And I heard this crashing sound coming through the brush. And I was nervous because I was wondering if it was a coyote coming at me. And I thought, if that's coming at me, my 22 is not going to do the trick. And then I saw it was a doe. And she turned and ran towards her right. And right behind her was this massive buck. Mm. His nose right up in her crotch area. Okay. <laughs> I was like, okay, someone is a. I was like, that was. I've never seen a rut like that before. Wow. I was able to watch. And over the next hour, I could still smell the doe's urine. Wow. Yeah. And the, like two more large bucks were also hot on that same trip. Mm -hmm. I was like, I just saw three massive bucks that I would happily put on my wall in the course of one hour because they're all chasing this one hot doe. Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny because, yeah, like, and you said you were squirrel hunting. And so that some of the things that I, that I was thinking of, like, I was thinking of a trout fishing trip when when I saw these wood ducks swimming around a brood of wood ducks on a trout stream and I wasn't duck hunting, you know, but I was just observing in the same way. And I came up real quiet and I'm like, I'm just going to hang back here. And anyway, and I see this shadow and the mom gets to the nerve, the, the ducklings are skittering all over the water. Mom starts to do that squeal alarm cry. And all of a sudden this shadow comes up 
and grabbed one of the grabbed one of the ducklings and ate it. And it was the trout stream with no access to any bigger water. So it was it was a trout I think that took the duck. But it was like that same way like you're quiet, the woods forget you're there, and you see these things. They're like, well, this is actually this is how things really operate. Super cool. A lot of squirrels. Hilarious. Mother Nature's it's got a kind of a grim sense point. of humor, I think. It's teasing, yeah. This was cool. She was raising a hunting family, but she doesn't hunt herself. Yeah. So she and I were going to this mill pond close to home, and I was like, I like sitting out here because I used to go fishing out here. And we literally just sat for an hour, and I think we spent 20 minutes watching this heron stalk a fish, and then we saw it get him, and I was mm. like, that's what it's all about. We got, right? the, we got the real life nature documentary. <laughs> and you realize that hunting isn't just peculiar to humans, it's all across the, oh, yeah. you know, the animal kingdom. I jokingly tell her more than once, I'm like, the reason honey, I can't break up with you or get divorced from the area <laughs> because she always wanted her future husband to teach her kids how to hunt because her grandpa was a deer hunter. Uh -huh. and <laughs> so like, okay, I can't break up with her ever. That's crazy. The Good real story. reason. Huh. <laughs> huh. Yeah, and I love her. <laughs> that's that's minor detail, minor detail. <laughs> um so this is these are just sort of some ways that adults learn and that it's a little bit different than kids. And so like, you know, with kids you, you kind of tell them what to do and you sort of have to because they're not fully formed and they can get themselves into trouble, but adults are there because you know they want to be there so you don't have to tell them oh well hunting is is good or hunting is important the fact that they're there s says that they're interested in, in learning and they're on the journey um and i think it's again to kids have a different experience of the world than us so kind of explaining things for them but also you don't have to sit out and it's kind of their hunt um not yeah. making them sit out you know until right. absolute end time for the deer or going out first no, thing may, in the maybe they want to. Yeah, know, maybe they, they want, want to. to. But also it's like, if you're like, man, I know once this time hits, everybody's going to start being active again. And the kid's like, and you go pee. Yep. <laughs> and you know, like, exactly. <laughs> it's time to get out of the woods, you know, like, and maybe you get out another day. And that, leaving it as a positive experience, yep. I think is so critical. And, you know, the um, other thing too is like a lot of people that do come through these classes are experienced in the outdoors. They just don't know how to pick up a shotgun or fishing rod. So they'll, mm -hmm. they'll backpack, they'll, they'll hike. And so they have, they have some of the gear. They have a lot of the knowledge. It's just that it's, it's, so if you frame it in terms of like, this is an adventure, kind of like a backpacking trip is an adventure, except that you might come home with some meat, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, instead of just getting exercise. And I think it's important not to sort of diss on those, those, those sports because a lot, a lot of people that I know, they're backpackers and they're hunters, you know, and so it's sort of like it's not an either or type deal. Um, you know, relevancy, they want to know why, not just that you tell them to do it. Um, if you talk about tradition, like I think about like Gordon McQuarrie and Ernest Hemingway and all these outdoor writers that I like, if you didn't grow up in the tradition, that's not going to mean very much to you. Or like maybe if there are guys talking about hunting, it's in your woman, it's, it's not super important or attractive and so it's sort of like you gotta when you talk about the tradition it's, it's not a meaningful concept mm -hmm. in someone unless someone has really started to plug in you well know? and i think it's important too as far as everybody has a why and you know like even here the picture with the cooking yep how much satisfaction do you get from cooking what you caught you know what you took and maybe that's it and they just haven't experienced it yet because john was really good even with our pheasant hunt you'll see he's doing a cooking demo later um amazing cook with all the wild game stuff pick his brain if you need ideas but he sent us home with like an apricot pheasant like golden raisin pheasant recipe and i was like this sounds a little okay we're getting a little crunchy with this and then i went home and i made it and i was like now i know how to make pheasant and this is delicious and that was like a huge motivator for me because I would have never done that, you know? And so having those resources too, even how to cook and preserve and yeah. butcher, and, and that's, that's a whole, that's another for, barrier thing. It's a barrier and it's definitely part of classes too. Um, whenever we do the classes, we definitely do the butchering and at least a 30,000 view of like, you don't need to kill it twice. You know, you killed it once, <laughs> don't cook the snot out of it. 
if it, if it's, it starts the size of a roast and ends up like a bar of soap, you're going to have problems. You know, <laughs> it's just not going to be good. Uh, so more adult stuff. You know, common values. I think we talked a little bit about that. And you know, as, as, as a rule too, I mean, you know, I might lean one way politically. People might lean another way. It, I mean, if if it comes up and your mentee initiates it and you're comfortable with it, sure. But in general, I try to avoid topics that can be kind of like, I don't know, someone said, yeah, you know, you don't discuss politics and religion with strangers. And as, as a rule, I feel like that's unless you know the person pretty well, you probably don't do the deep dive on that stuff. And, but there's a lot of common stuff to focus on, like up here, you know, the you, you both care about the environment. You care about, you know, the animal's welfare yep. um, and, and using it. Also, like, especially at the bottom, like the perceptions, feelings about death and killing. Somebody that's never killed something before, you don't know how they're going to react. I mean, you just don't, you know, they may feel like they're totally fine and they even may get that shot, be able to have a perfect shot and not feel comfortable taking it. And I think respecting that is a big thing because I've heard of situations both ways and you want people to have the good experience. They may not be comfortable, you know, dressing it out after the fact because that may be too much for them up front. Right. And so I think those differences, especially like you just don't know somebody that's never done it before. It, you know, one of the things I always like, you know, I remember first year I had this job, I used to do the same work for Turkey Federation, I don't know, 2016 maybe. So right back to back, I had two deer learn to hunt, and one happened to be with a woman hunter and one happened to be a guy hunter. And so like they had the opposite reactions that you would think that a gendered person would, would, so the guy was very, you know, he didn't want his picture taken and he was very just sort of like, I just need to chill with this for a while. And the woman hunter was like, damn it, high five, drive that home. <laughs> so it's like a, and it's like, and on one hand, I was a little I'm, bit taken, but it's sort of like, well, he ought to be able to have that response, and she ought to be able to have that response. There's no reason in principle. And that's kind of just the perception you brought to the table versus Correct. it's kind of funny. I feel like a lot of women hunters that are really gung-ho, I feel like they're ready to be elbow deep in those guts, and they want to get that out, and that is like the funnest, funnest thing, and it's like, you do you. Like, but honestly, either way. It, slide about mentoring women. I mean, I, I would be kind of dumb for me to try to handle that one if you want to. I mean, I think you're fully qualified. <laughs> well, I mean, I, qualified. I tease. I tease because he's mentored okay. women. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I am, I've done mentoring so far with fishing with women. And then I also did mentoring as far as with handling firearms and shooting and that sort of stuff. Properly mentoring with hunting, I'm still kind of on my journey of learning everything I need to for that. But women, they want to know why. You just take your time to explain things. You need to talk to them, make sure they're comfortable. Because again, sometimes it's like you freeze up as far as, I don't know what's going on. I'm overwhelmed with this. Um, you know, I think always ask before touching and explaining, like, you don't know somebody's past and that sort of stuff. And so always just having that conversation, hey, can I show you, can I come up behind you and show you how, you know, you should be shouldering the gun or, you know, X, Y, Z. That I think is a huge thing of respect and that uh, makes people feel way more comfortable. Um, you know, our experience of the outdoors is different. You guys are able to go to the bathroom easier. <laughs> so <laughs> that's another thing to think about. So, you know, talk about facilities, talk about options, um, you know, before you get out there. And then talk about what they, what's the important thing for them for the day. Do they want to take a big buck? Do they want to pass on does? Or do they just want to sit out there and have the experience of being in the woods? Um, you know, I think it's just a different mindset. And, I mean, let them drive it, you know. Put it back on them if you're not sure of, like, hey, this is my first time, you know, taking a new female hunter out. What do you want to do? I think having that conversation is going to save any concerns or headaches or anything that can be there. Um, but John does an amazing job. You know, like I said earlier, I'm here because I'm like, we need more female hunters. We need more female mentors. And then I've kind of gotten volunteered along the way, but not everybody has that amount of like, let's just go get it done. <laughs> so you're, you're a victim <laughs> of your own initiative. There. I really am <laughs> in the best way possible. Everybody's been great up here. Um, yeah, so the harvest is a big deal, you know, um, but it's, it's part of it. And let people, I guess that story I was saying, everyone has a different response to it, you know, and I, I've always said the moment I stop having an emotional response is the day I stop hunting, you know, like they're, you're connected to them. It's not like I'm going to like burst into tears if I shoot a squirrel, but I have some sense of loss. Mm -hmm. 
and it, it tends to be higher the further you go up the scale, maybe more with deer, although that's kind of arbitrary, but it's sort of like if I don't have that sense of connection, it would, it, for me, it would not work. I feel it was just sort I of mean, killing them. I name every fish I catch Bob, and I'm like, go back to all your cousins, Bob. And like, <laughs> it's part of the experience of like, I'm being silly, but I'm also, you know, that's in my own way showing my own respect. So we're talking about, you know, comfort. Comfort's really important. You know, these folks are dressed, you know, pretty much appropriately for the, for the rabbit hunt. That guy on the right probably could have had better pants, but, um, you know, just, just keep checking in, make sure people aren't too cold, too hot. Um, and it's another barrier as far as what do I wear when I'm getting out there? You're like, man, it's going to be freezing. I'm going to put all these layers on and then yep. you're going to sweat and you're going to sit there and get yep. that chill. And having that conversation, you should be a little cold when you're hiking out there because you can have your bibs, you can have That's well heated said. everything, but it's going to be useless if you get that layer of sweat. And, you know, that honestly was for me, I'm not used to the cold up here. And everybody tells me this is a mild winter for Wisconsin. Yeah, well. <laughs> and so <laughs> for me, that's a big thing of, you know, take carry those layers in because you're going to be sitting there, have the hand warmers X, Y, Z, because that's another barrier of an equipment thing. Um, and then one thing too, is like, as far as like on the average, I think that women have, um, you know, higher core body temperatures. So I think in, in the digits, feet and hands like I know this with my daughter tends to get colder sooner as a rule not yep. always but so you gotta it's another sort of check-in point um and, and I can be really sensitive to the cold so it's like I'm the one with the like rechargeable hand warmers and the disposable ones and like knowing that ahead of hand, ahead of time as an option how are you finding women's clothing do you, oh. do you wear because they're warmer, or so, is it now forming is better? So, you know, especially because I'm a little bit more of a non-traditional for a woman, as far as I'm tall, and I'm kind of built for a woman. Um, I started off wearing a lot of guy things, but then you get something that can fit all parts of me, yeah. and then it's a bag. You know, something to fit my hips is going to fit nowhere else, and it starts being a headache. So I started off wearing a lot of guy stuff. I still wear a lot of guy stuff. And since moving up here, I actually learned DSG out of Madison is, has been amazing. And I feel like women's clothing is getting a lot better because I know there's companies, I forget the name of it, um, but companies where you can actually send in your measurements for the different proportions hmm. and get custom waders. You know, the waders I got, I got the biggest, I wanted the clear water Orvis waders. I'm like, this is a sign that I'm finally my fly fisherman. Mm -hmm. They're not designed for women yeah. like me. And so... DSG has been amazing. They're affordable. I have a pair of, um, hunt, I got some hunting jackets, hunting um, bibs, all of that sort of stuff. And it honestly, it's a pain in the butt because you have to try so much different stuff before you can find something that fits for you. Yeah. So it honestly is a barrier because my hunting bib versus the bib that I prefer, it's one of those big baggy ones that are designed for guys. And it doesn't fit and me. It doesn't. It's kind of cumbersome, but at the same time, it gets the job done. Would you say it's slowly evolving? It's. I would say it's up and coming. I feel like it's more of a conversation among a lot of companies. I'm seeing a lot more offerings, but even with within that, you're still kind of limited. So I think DSG is pretty inclusive with sizing. They go up pretty large, um, and I think more and more companies are having that conversation. So I feel like it's for sure getting better. I still tend to because I'm so tall. You know, I'm not the short, petite thing. Sitka, I ordered the largest women's size in Sitka. God help me. It's like, it's like a compression jacket, you know? And so it's like, even when they're like, well, we're, you know, inclusive to women. And it's like, but you're kind of the male focused company that just kind of tacked this on, mm -hmm. you know, versus DSG is full. I mean, designed mm -hmm. for women for everything from fishing to hunting. Mm. So I think the resources are there, but I think the conversation needs to keep being had. Mm because I didn't know about any of this stuff until I started getting as involved as I am up here. Be a good slide, like a resource yeah. thing too. Yeah, because I mean, even the, the waiter situation, it's like, I probably would have saved and gotten one where I could get it fitted that fits properly. I can have layers under and you know, when it's cold in the spring to get out um, versus, you know, my clear waters where I'm like, okay guys, can somebody bend over and get that mm -hmm. for me? <laughs> Just because I'm like, I want to wear my waders. So I think that's a really good question because it is a barrier. Um, and it's one that I'm still learning to navigate. And like places like Her Upland, we have mm. another person that went turkey hunting with us that's involved there. And, you know, she's tried different, you know, 
some of it's really cheaply made. And, you know, I, I bought a pair of turkey pants through Orvis. Again, largest size, my proportions. I, w I was like, okay, this is as much as yeah. I can squat, you know? And then DSG, I got a pair of turkey pants and I'm like, okay, wow. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's a luxury just to be able yeah. to move. So I think that is an, like an ongoing barrier and it's another thing to really think about. So I think that's, you know, a great question. Have you, uh, are you familiar with the, I think it's Brent's head, Cabela's branch, the sheet? Yep, I, I've heard good things about that. I just haven't gotten a chance to like, since I'm new to up here and there's not an actual Cabela's here. <laughs> Sun Prairie. Oh, well, not, not here. I guess that's here. not here. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I've heard good things about that because it's also affordable. Because, you know, I think it's another important thing. Um, the last turkey hunt I went on, they're like, you know, we're going to be running and gunning. And they're like, but they're also like, we want to make sure you know that we got all, most of our like camo at Goodwill. Like it's not, you don't need to go buy the Sitka. You don't, you know, I bought one piece of Sitka because I was like, I just want something. And then I'm like, it's the most ill-fitted of everything mm -hmm. I own, you know? And so it's not about brand name, any of that sort of stuff. I think any experienced hunter knows that, but coming in, you're like, oh, I got to mm. get all the things. They don't fit and they're expensive. And then you're like, I, I hate make this sure experience. We're doing good yeah, here. I think we're no, getting we're close. Getting close. Uh, and I'll just wrap up. So the other thing is like, um, just that it's not just necessarily about getting out and hunting or, or fishing. You know, it's it's about uh, the whole the whole experience, game feeds, trap shooting, scouting. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna just kind of run through these so we have time for questions here. Uh, boy, I'm long winded here. Uh, mentoring, you know, things to practice. Um, these are some barriers just to sort of look at, look at them. I don't know if, if you're here, you probably barriers may not be quite so relevant. Well, and I think also if we can, we have all the resources in here, call up yeah. DNR, yep. call or, up Pheasants Forever. They all have been playing this game, you know, for how long with R3 recruitment and all that good stuff. And so it's like, there's resources that you can call and just get it. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I was going to say, I got my contact info um, yep. on here. But yeah, this is our friend who was at, mutual friend who was at Turkey yep, Camp. She's probably part of her upland and she's part of, she like went through and tried different turkey pants. Like her and I were talking about it. We actually went fishing a couple weekends ago. Um, and she was like, you know, I told her, I was like, I really want to get this one brand. You know, women, we don't like to look like a block when we're out there. Uh, <laughs> That's just like what we're conditioned as, you know, as a society of like, we want something where we feel comfortable and it's a little bit more form fitting. But then also like, you know, sometimes we just want a nice color. The deer don't care. <laughs> so um, um, I told her this pair of pants that I was wanting to get and she was like, honestly, that's the one. It's like a 200 pair, buck pair of pants. She's like, they fell apart so quickly. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? So. But anyways, I'll just never stop talking. So you could take the mentor pledge through Pheasants Forever and, the, and enroll in some really great, um, so these are the rules. Just go to pheasantsforever.com, just go to and search mentor pledge. It's a great way to get enrolled um, for, some, for some gear discounts and, and possibly. BHA, the little table as you walk out the door here, they have where you can actually scan and sign up. And I think it's for deer. Um, waterfowl and there's another one because they need more mentors they I think they he was mentioning that he has the classes full for mentees and there's a big demand people I think there is a big demand overall because even John has classes that fill up pretty quickly all the time yeah but mentors are the limiting factor across the board and you know? if you could take a photo of that or whatever you can contact me you can contact my colleague mm -hmm. Emily at DNR I don't I mean, know if, if you, you want to share info yeah if you but... want my contact information you can come grab it I'm more than welcome to share because you know, I'm starting to get more people as I talk about my passion of stuff. You know, I have a group of women that are wanting me to help get them out fishing. You know, they grew up, have their husbands fish and they just want to take it up of their own. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I'm more than happy to be a resource for everybody as well. Um, so kind of that being said, any yeah. questions? What's everybody thinking? Do you have somebody that you can think of that would be a good kind of 